we're very glad to see you all here today. It looks like a packed house. I don't think I've seen it this full for a long time. Did you do a little <laughs> advertising, uh, Sir Joe? <laughs> anyway, today I think we're in for a real treat. I'd like to welcome you to the Reed and Christine Halliday Executive Lecture Series. Uh, today we have with us Sarah Joy Pond, who is a designer, educator, evaluator, and social entrepreneur, and has presented social impact and capacity building research and training seminars on three continents. Founder of the tippingbucket.org, she's currently enjoying the roller coaster ride of building a social business that changes the world and pays the rent. She's intensely fond of typography, symphonic cello, and stat stracciatelli. Yeah. Good grief. Some kind of ice cream, I think. Stracciatella gelato. And detests bad line breaks, bean soup, and writing her own bio. So with that, I think we're almost up and going. So let's go ahead and welcome Sarah Joy Pond, please. OK. Is that working? Yeah. I think we may need to move this a little bit closer. OK. Can you hear me? You good? All right. OK, so today we're going to talk about what it's like to be in a startup, for real. And I'm going to be really, really honest with you. And you feel free to laugh. There are going to be times when you're going to want to. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that there will also be some commiseration that will happen because of this. So one of the things that I've noticed in being in a startup is that everything seems to be a paradox. They're, they're, everything is just at odds with each other. Everything is you have night and day in the same block of an hour. And I've come to call that startup schizophrenia. And I want to talk about several different types of this. That is not what I wanted that to do. I think your computer responds differently than mine. OK. So the first, the first paradox is acting big and acting small. So in acting small, one of the biggest advantages that I've seen is that there are times when you have to, you always have to be conscious that you are a startup that the resources are limited, that they could run out at any moment. <laughs> and being able to act like a small company, even when you have big dreams, is a bit of a challenge. Um, but by doing that, and by working out of your basement, or in our case, my dining room, for six months, you gain advantages that you wouldn't have if you immediately started acting big. At the same time, Acting, oh geez, it's really not going where I think it's going to. Okay, Acting big has its advantages as well. And acting big from the start can give you a lot of advantage that you wouldn't have otherwise. Um, the best example for, of this for us is when we decided to go talk to the Peace Corps. Really large, really old, well-established organization. We are at this point six months old. We have only done I think 10 projects by then, um, raised about $20,000, really little. But we walked into the Peace Corps and decided we want to be your channel partner. We want to be the only one you work with to post your projects that you're currently having trouble fundraising for. And here's why you should work with us. And that was a big move. That was acting like we were a lot bigger and a lot more established than we were. But it worked. And that partnership has been one of the greatest things that's happened to us. Another um, dimension of startup schizophrenia is what I call group hugs and guillotines. So for the first you know, group hugs, there's this closeness and this complete engagement with other people. And in a startup, in any company, I think, I think there are advantages to it, this well beyond the startup phase. The more that you can bring in and enmesh your community into what you're doing, the better off you'll be. Um, in Tipping Bucket, we are really, really transparent. Um, our whole community knows what's going on. They know when we have a triumph. They know when we fall flat on our face. And because of that, um, we have this, this affinity. People are defensive of us. They, they stand up for us. They, um, you know, they send us random notes in, the, in email that just say, hey, keep going. We're thinking of you. We love you. Um, they post about us on their Facebook, on their personal stuff, when we don't even ask them to. Um, there's love there. There's this, this real feeling of community. And because of that, we are stronger than we ever could be. There's only three of us. <laughs> you know, we have three people in an office scrambling and working like crazy. But we've accomplished something that companies that have 50 and 100 employees haven't done. 
because we have a community that feels like a group hug. And, and that has been really, really important to us. At the same time, it's just not going, oh, oh dear, that's really not what I wanted. I'm sorry, the controls are really different on a PC than on a Mac. Uh, let's see, okay, there we go. Um, at the same time, when it comes down to it, running a startup, you have no one to blame but yourself. And when the guillotine comes down, it's your head. And it has to be, because when it comes to taking responsibility, you can't blame the group. You can't blame even the people who work with you, and certainly not the people who support you. So when it comes to taking accountability, you have to be in a guillotine, not in a group hug. Um, the next paradox, and yes, I use Disney princesses. I'm sorry, that's the only thing I could think of. Because trust me, when you search ingenue and femme fatale on Google, you are not going to see mostly Disney princesses. And those images were not appropriate to put up here. <laughs> so, so we're going with Disney princesses. Um, as a startup, you have to be both an ingenue and a femme fatale. In that way, in a startup, and especially in, in social entrepreneurship, where you're tackling problems that really matter and that are huge and overwhelming and complex and embedded, and um, there's a technical term actually called wicked problems, um, which entails that the same people who are trying to solve it are the ones that cause the problem in the first place. And when you're tackling those, naivety is a strategic advantage. <laughs> Not having a full understanding of what it is you're up against is a good way to start. <laughs> because you probably won't start if you don't start that way. And, and having the, the bright-eyed optimism is an incredible strength, and it's something you're going to need. And you're going to need to be able to come back to um, over and over and over again in the course of that journey. At the same time, and this is Meg, she's not as well known as Belle, but I grew up with six sisters. <laughs> and um, Meg is a femme fatale. She's not, she's not evil. Um, she's not even mean, but she is very, very cunning. She understands everything about a situation before she goes into it, and she calculates exactly what she needs to do in order to get the advantage she needs. And as a startup, as, a, as the leader of a company, you need to do that. You need to know exactly what's going on with all of your competition. You need to get into their heads and understand them. You do not ignore competition. You don't brush it on the bug. You certainly don't minimize it. You understand exactly what's going on in the situations that you're encountering and deeply and in all their complexity, you get as far into that situation as you can before you actually have to interact with it so that you know what needs to happen for you to get what you need. So, I'm sorry. Um, ingenue and femme fatale is another one of the, the schizophrenias. Oh, jeez, I'm so sorry about this. This is really challenging me. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, the fourth one um, is the balance between failing fast, um, failing early, failing often, <laughs> failing publicly, and keeping things in perspective. So this is a very appropriate picture for us. And both of these stories that I'm going to tell you relate to the number 100. Um, the first bucket that we ever did, um, we it was are you so nervous? We had put everything in place. We had designed everything. We'd done our research. We'd got, gone through this whole process of planning and preparation, and we were finally ready to actually put up the project and see what happened. And we put up the project, and in the course of a couple days, it tipped. It was only $500. It was a really little start, and we tried actually not to let it get out too much because we weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, but a couple hundred people chipped in their little drops in the bucket and tipped this bucket. And when it came time to collect the donations, we went through the technical processes. It went exactly as we thought. It had all been set up properly, and it worked. And we were thrilled. <laughs> and I remember sitting down for dinner with my family that night and just being pleased as pop that this stuff had all gone the way we thought it was going to. About halfway through dinner, I get this panicked phone call from Doug, who's our program director. And he says, Sarah Joy, Sarah Joy, I don't know what happened. I don't understand. $100 just came out of my bank account. And I said, a hundred? How much did you donate? And he's like, a dollar? And we realized that because of a coding error in our program, our program was reckoning everyone's donations in pennies.
and the donation processor was processing it in dollars. So we charged every single one of our first donors, a couple hundred people on our first projects, 100 times what they donated. Not double, not 10, 100 times what they had donated. This was probably the biggest failure I could imagine at the time, and we panicked. It was terrifying. Um, and we, we caught it just a couple hours after we had, trans, after we had processed the donations. Um, and so we actually were able to reverse it before most of the charges had fully gone through people's bank accounts and credit cards. And then we were faced with this choice. We had, we'd, we'd gotten about 12 emails in, you know, up until the point where the charges were actually reversed. But there were several hundred people who had donated. So only a tiny fraction of them had noticed or cared, and we were able to resolve those concerns pretty well. So we've got this choice now. We've talked for months and months about how one of our core values is transparency. And now we're sitting here having made a huge, stupid mistake in our very first project. Do we tell them? Most of them won't even notice. Most of them won't, I mean, it would never, it would never occur to them. It won't affect them. It's not going to hurt them. Do we tell them? And I'm here to tell you that failing transparently, failing publicly, is one of the best things you could ever do. Because a lot of that group hug feeling I was talking about earlier came because we did tell them. We sent out an email to everyone on the list, even the people who hadn't donated, just in case, <laughs> to tell them what had happened. To let them know that we recognize the problem, we know where it came from, and we fixed it. Um, and to, to let them know that, that this wasn't going to be a, a pattern, but that failure is a part of these kind of ventures, and we will always, always come, front and accept, come forward and accept responsibility for our mistakes. And I, was, I braced myself for the response from that. I was sure we were going to show up on blogs that was like, complete incompetence, don't ever trust this website. <laughs> like, you know, what, what were they thinking? And what showed up instead was, here's an example of how to fail. And we were, we were held up as heroes rather than the idiots that we actually were. And, and that's, that was a powerful lesson for us. Um, right now, Tipping Bucket is in what we call a departure stall. Uh, I don't know if any of you are pilots, but in aviation, if you, when you take off, you, there's a possibility of getting off the ground, but if the angle of attack is too high, like if you're trying to climb too fast and the plane is too heavy, you can't climb. And it's called a departure stall. The plane got off the ground, but it's not going to be able to clear the obstacles in its path because the angle of attack is too high. And we've been kind of in a departure stall for the last couple of months. We ran out of funding, ran out of runway, and, um, and we haven't had an active project on the site for about two months. This is killing me. And it's, it's been a really, really hard thing to deal with. Because from my perspective, from the way I see it, this thing that I have put everything I've got into is on life support, and it might die. And it's, oh dear, <laughs> I'm being long-winded. Um, no, it's fine. Um, but the other part of this paradox between failing publicly, failing openly, failing fast and often, is to keep things in perspective. Maybe, yes. Um, and for me, this perspective came when I was working on a federal grant application and did some research about the, the background and, and the environment in which Tipping Bucket exists. Um, we are structured as a nonprofit, and there are a lot of different complex reasons for that. Primarily, it's because the perception of tax deduction is very important to consumers in this country. Most of us actually don't itemize our taxes, but we think we might need to, and so it's really important to us to get a tax deduction for donations. So we are a 501c3. What I learned in the process of doing this research is that fewer than 3% of all the literally 10 million nonprofits that are operational in the United States right now. Fewer than 3% of them will ever cross the threshold of um, $100,000 of revenue or more in a year. And while I'm sitting here just alternating between panic and despair <laughs> about an organization that I feel is on life support and isn't going to make it, while I'm sitting there in that state, we cross that threshold. 
in our first year of operation. So it's really important to count the triumphs as well. It's really easy to get caught up in and to, to feel really acutely the skinned knees and the bumped nose and the embarrassment of falling flat on your face in front of the whole world. But it's important to really count and understand and keep in perspective what you've actually accomplished as well. And we sit here now as a not quite year older organization. Our birthday is actually next week, March 3rd. And, and we have done 35 projects in 20 different countries and raised $100,000, mostly in $1 donations. And that's, that's something to be proud of, and it's important to keep that in perspective. So, startup schizophrenia is a real part of life. It's something you're gonna have to learn to deal with if you're gonna run your own business. And it's exciting and frustrating, <laughs> and, um, but doable. And those paradoxes don't have to tear you apart. Um, they, can be, they can add richness and dimension to the work that you're doing. And one of the things that kind of carries through all of these things we're talking about is innovation. And this is my favorite, favorite definition of innovation. Albert Sensgjörki, I think is how you say that. <laughs> He's a Hungarian um, biochemist and physicist. I have no idea what else he did, but he said this, and that makes him cool. Um, innovation means seeing what everyone has seen and thinking what no one has thought. Um, and that, to me, is the essence of, of what carries people through the, the schizophrenia of startups. Um, I'm gonna, I wanna talk, and this is gonna be challenging because I can't see you, so you're gonna like wave your hand instead of just raising it. But anybody remember these word problem things from the GRE or the SAT? I'm a nerd and I think they're so fun. But um, innovation is to entrepreneurship as blank is to blank. I want you to think about that for a second and I wanna talk through a couple of your ideas of what is that relationship? Innovation is to entrepreneurship as what is to what? Yes. Uh, apple is to trees. Oh, tell me what you, apple is to tree is what he said. So talk nice and loud and say what, how, what do you mean? Apple is to apple is tree. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's a good clarification. <laughs> Very interesting, thank you. Who else? Oh, come on. Yes. As food is to life. Explain that a little bit. Right. And you can go without food for a little while, right? It's not very comfortable, but you can. And businesses can go for a little while with no innovation. But, you know, if they start out really fat, they can go longer. If you start out skinny, you're not going to last very long. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Who else? I really am going to wait. Innovation is to entrepreneurship as, what is to what? Oh, thank you. I told you you'd have to wave, sorry. Uh, um, I was thinking uh, social media and software. Oh. So social media is creating drama on social media itself. But it's also an innovation to take that software. But if we can enjoy that thing, we can talk to each other through sound and drama. Yeah. Excellent analogy, thank you. There are a lot of processes that have to happen in order to transform the raw goodness of innovation into something that actually produces a usable product. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Innovation is the entrepreneurship as entrepreneurship is the time of freedom. What I mean by that is, I mean, I'm sure when you started the business, you realized I'm sick of being leveraged. I think you need to spend your, your life being leveraged or doing the leveraging. Church, people always use the word delegation. That's they're almost synonymous in some ways. But in my mind, a business you, you start a business to enjoy the benefits of a business, not to do the day in day out operations of a business. And there's so many business owners that I know that are stressed and they're depressed and they're like, I don't have the luxury of time. 
Uh huh. They need to learn leverage. They need to learn how to leverage more people. And, uh, so innovation can be a lever in entrepreneurship. Excellent point. Thank you. Any other ideas? Okay. From that, that's a good start. A good starting point. Thank you. So, kind of ties in with the chocolate <laughs> and and with the leverage that in some ways. Innovation is to entrepreneurship as frosting is to cake. That innovation is kind of the fun part. Um, it's, the, it's the part that you can, can decorate with, you can put it in all different shapes, it's, it's exciting, it's new, it changes all the time. Um, but without the cake, I mean, is there anybody in here who likes to eat frosting, like large quantities of frosting without cake? Okay, you guys are freaks. Um, <laughs> but frosting, frosting is good because of the way it pairs with cake. And innovation is productive and, and can make things happen because of the way it pairs with the work of entrepreneurship. And it's important, I think, to, to, to understand it that way and to know that entrepreneurship is not gonna be all innovation. It's not gonna be all the fun stuff and the, the great brainstorming and the, um, the big new ideas, but there's a lot of that and it's awful fun. Um, another way to look at it is that innovation is to entrepreneurship as mortar is to bricks. Um, what does mortar do for bricks? Hold it together, makes it stronger. What else? What? It makes it look better, <laughs> it does. Anything else, what's the purpose of mortar? It holds it together, but how and why? What? It unifies. it unifies the bricks into one whole. Excellent. Louder. It fills, it fills in the cracks. Very good. Is it possible to build without mortar? Yes. Give me an example. Adobe bricks. Adobe bricks yes. What else? Wood. Wood. Yes. Is it possible to build without stone? <laughs> with, with stone without mortar. I should have clarified that. Thank you. So we have adobe bricks. Yes. The pyramids. the pyramids. Excellent. Another one. The cathedrals. Most of the great European cathedrals were built without mortar. So it is possible. Why then did we start using mortar? Yeah. Because there was uh, the, the building blocks of the bricks themselves were not uniform, so you had the depth. Uh -huh. The decreased surface area that affects the stability of the structure, say, the bison is trying to raise a pillar. <laughs> right. Okay, so the, the surface of the materials that we're using weren't uniform. In order to build without mortar, the, the material has to be perfectly planed. It has to be perfectly sized. It has to be perfectly placed. And similarly, in, in business, things are not perfectly sized, perfectly planed, perfectly placed. They're not. We deal with ill-structured problems. We deal with constantly changing um, situations. We deal with unstable and unpredictable and ununiform problems. So the mortar helps fill in the gaps and make these things work together when they wouldn't work together on their own. And for me, innovation is, is what fills in those gaps. It's the thing that can put together things that might not fit otherwise. It's the thing that can hold together a situation that's a little bit tenuous, a little bit um, less perfectly structured than you'd like it to be. And it's this seeing what everyone else is seeing, but thinking something different that does that. Um, I want to give you a couple of examples from Tipping Bucket. Tipping Bucket is founded on a fundamentally different equation than most of nonprofit work. Um, most of nonprofit relies on big ideas, big money, and um, what was the other one? <laughs> a few people with big money, basically. Big hearts. A few people with big hearts and a lot of money. And Tipping Bucket turns that equation on its head and relies on a few people with big ideas plus a lot of people with big hearts and a little bit of money to do the same thing. So for me, that was seeing this landscape and, and seeing 
the relatively small amount of money that the majority of the world had to give, just like everybody else. I mean, why do you think most nonprofits go after big donors? It's because they see that the majority of the world has very little to give. We saw the same thing, but we thought something entirely different. Instead of thinking, not worth it, we thought, that's where we want to be. That's where the power is. Um, another way that we changed the model is that most people, if they've done any more than passing involvement in nonprofit work, have, th have seen half done projects or poorly done projects. Anybody? I, have, I, have, I can't tell you how many half built schools, half built bridges, half developed um, clinics um, that I have seen in the developing world. And why do they stop? Because the money runs out. And we, we saw that same problem, and instead of thinking, oh, there's just got to be more money, there's, there's got to be this constant donor support for it. We saw that same problem and thought differently. We thought, no, you need to know what you need going into it, and you need to get everything you need before you start or you don't get it. And we have an all or nothing funding model. Sorry. Um, where a project goes into the bucket, they go in one at a time, they know exactly what they need to move forward, and they are encouraged to be realistic, not ask for what they think we can give. They're encouraged to actually take into account what's going on in the situation and plan for the exigencies that are gonna happen. They go in, they tell us what they need, we give them an amount of time. If they collect enough donations and the bucket tips, they get their money and they go forward with their project. If they don't, none of the transactions are processed and the money goes back to the donors. So seeing the same problem of half-completed projects as everybody else saw, we thought something differently. And that's innovation. Um, this is, sorry, that's just an example of the web page I was supposed to go to that earlier. Um, one of the other things that, uh, that is comparable to bricks and mortar for me is that innovation doesn't just happen once. Innovation isn't the start of the idea and then it goes away and you're back to just laying bricks. You need mortar in between every layer of bridge. You need innovation at every step of the process in building a business and building an idea. For us, we started out, we were so excited, great idea, loved it, started digging in to what it was gonna take, and we discovered credit card fees, and they suck. How much do you think comes out of $1 donation to the credit card companies? 20, nope, higher. 30, higher. Not quite. <laughs> 35 cents. 35 cents of the first dollar of every credit card transaction. When you're looking at one dollar transactions, that's a freaking lot of money. <laughs> and a lot of what you need, especially when we have decided that it is fundamental to our model that 100% of the donation goes to the projects. So digging in just a little ways into this process, we discover a huge obstacle. And it was clear to see that many people who had started down this path before us had come up against that same obstacle and made a choice. What's the logical choice? Charge more. Minimum donation. That is why nearly every site you go to on the internet requires at least a $15 donation because the break-even point is 12. That's where it starts to make sense to use a credit card. So we could see that other people who had started down this path had come up against that obstacle, had seen what we were seeing now, and we knew what they thought and what they had decided. And the biggest difference for Tipping Bucket was what we thought instead. And the best way to describe this is a quote from, oh crap, I just forgot his name, Daniel Farragut in the American Civil War. Um, his, his quote, and I'm, I think it's paraphrased, but the basic story is the entry, entrance to this bay was really, really heavily guarded. And everything that, you know, every logical explanation, every good advice, every piece of, of self-preservation instinct he had would say, turn around, you are not getting through that. Um, and his response was, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And that was our response. You know, we saw this, um, this crazy obstacle of 35% credit card fees on a $1 transactions and said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, we'll figure it out. And you know what we have? 
We figured out how to do that. And we now have most of our donors as $1 donors. And the credit card fees haven't killed us. We heard that over and over again. They're going to squash you. They're going to cr crush you. The credit card fees are going to kill you. They haven't killed us. And there's a lot to be said about looking at obstacles and choosing to see them differently, to, to think a different thought than everyone who's come up against that obstacle before you. Um, how much time do I have? I don't have a watch. Oh, sweet. We've got lots of time. Okay. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is a different way of seeing. Who can explain how 3D vision works? Yes. Excellent, excellent explanation. 3D vision, we see in three dimensions because our eyes are separate. Um, what's the Cyclops? Cyclopses can't see in 3D. If we only had one eye, we would not see three dimensional. Because the, the difference, we see, we see things just a little bit different, and our brains can make the calculation between those two images and see depth. So it's a triangulation function between the two images our eyes are seeing and our brains. So when we see in, in movie theaters, we're faking that because there is no actual depth on that screen. You know, all, the, all those points are of light are exactly the same distance from, from our eyes. So we trick our brain into thinking that they're a little bit different. So three dimensions, the depth and the richness that we perceive in life comes from slightly different perceptions from each of our eyes. And for me, we need to move into a time of seeing value and seeing problems three-dimensionally. Um, I imagine as business students, all of you have heard the phrase triple bottom line. Um, what does that refer to? Oh, tell me you've heard that. Maybe not. OK. Um, the triple bottom line is an idea of accounting for the impact that you're having on the planet, on people, and on your profits. So instead of a single bottom line of your monetary gain or loss, you account as well for the impact you're having on society and the impact you're having on the planet. People, planet, profit, triple bottom line. And currently, the way that this happens is more of a three-in-one bottom line than a triple bottom line. So these concepts are being conflated to one concept. We're going back to money because that's what we know. And we are accounting for the impact on the planet in terms of money. We're accounting for the impact on people in terms of money. There are all these complex strategies for calculating social return on investment, SROI. And they are, we're flattening what's happening. We're taking away this other way of seeing so that all we're seeing is a flat projection in terms of money. And the biggest thing for me about social entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship is, in my opinion, and granted, I'm biased because this is my life, but there, there is space in the market for people who will choose to think about and choose to obsess about problems that really matter, who will see the fact that a third of our planet doesn't have access to clean water. The fact that one in five women in the United States will be raped at some point in her life. The fact that during the course of this presentation, about an hour, by the time we're finished, 500 children will have died in Africa from starvation. Those are big problems. And we can't solve them by seeing in one dimension. There are market solutions to those problems. Some of those solutions look a lot like business. Some of those solutions look a lot like traditional nonprofit, but there's a whole spectrum in between. And if we will choose to see and to reckon the, the impact of what we're doing with more than one perspective, 
Understanding that there are different ways to value things, that money is not the bottom line. It's evolved that way because we're most experienced with it. But there are other ways of accounting value. There are other ways of understanding impact. And if we can actually pursue a triple bottom line rather than a three-in-one bottom line where all of those things are conflated and value is flat, then there is space. There's space in the market. There's space in the world. There's room for many, many, many bright, dedicated, hardworking people to solve problems that actually matter. And, and that, I think, is the essence of, of seeing what everyone has seen and thinking what no one has stopped. And I, I can tell you it's a ride. <laughs> it's an adventure. Um, and the ups and downs are probably more intense than they would be if you were dealing in one dimension only. But the reward is too. Um, Questions? I just want to talk to you now. What do you think? Okay. I was a little bit worried about that because I didn't do that very well. Let's see if I can. So, Tipping Bucket came about because um, I got sick and tired of being told that anything, that I was too young, I was too small, and anything I could ever do would be a drop in the bucket. I got tired of it. And um, the actual genesis of the, genesis of the idea happened because uh, I was meeting with a friend who was in the business school, and he was telling me about this woman in Guatemala City who runs a school there in the gang district. So most of her children have lost one or both parents um, and other family members to gang violence. Um, they are regularly shot at, there's explosions, there's tons of drugs, it's just a really messed up area. And this woman's been running a school for 10 years and she just refuses to give up. She's been held at gunpoint, she's been taken hostage, she's been robbed, she's been beaten, and she just won't give up. Um, the, they came up with this proposal to buy a little plot of land that has been in this area for you know, generations and has never been developed because the family won't sell it. They, they went in, acting big again, <laughs> and said, we want this land and here's what we're going to do with it. And the family agreed to sell. They have a plan for a school that would include space for a cancho, for a soccer field. And they could rent out that field every day and the revenues from that field would completely sustain the school. So this school would be self-sustaining from the day it was built. But it would cost $500,000. And I left that conversation thinking, okay, we've got to do this. This has to happen. Where am I going to get half a million dollars? Who do I know? Who do I know that has a half a million dollars? Who's, who do I know that knows someone that has half a million dollars? And I spent hours that night racking my brain. Um, and getting more and more discouraged as I did because I realized more and more profoundly that I didn't know anybody with half a million dollars to spare. And not only that, it was going to be not years, but decades before I would have that kind of money to throw out the problems I care about. And I went to sleep pretty discouraged that night. And the next morning, I literally woke up with a phrase in my head that was, no, Sarah Joy, you don't know one person with half a million dollars, but you are connected to half a million people with one dollar. And social media, social media, that paradigm shift of relationships, has enabled this, this putting of all the drops into one bucket that was never possible before. So Tipping Bucket is a mashup of one deal at a time retailing, like Steep and Cheap or Woot.com or Groupon. And all or nothing, um, all or nothing fundraising, the, like the tipping point that Groupon uses as well. That it was really fun to watch Groupon come after we had started this. And um, money back guarantees. So it's this mashup of things that really worked in other areas of business that we put together to solve a different problem. Does that answer your question? Kind of. <laughs> Yeah, so this is an example of a project. Um, this is just a mock-up of the homepage, actually. But it's, we've done 30 projects. The projects are in um, various impact sectors, so um, community, health, 
education, environment, energy, justice, and opportunity. And anyone can apply. You submit a proposal, it's workshops and mentored by experts in the field. Then it goes up on the site for a certain amount of time. You use social media to fill the bucket. If it tips, you get the money, you move forward, you report. If it doesn't, it all goes back to the donors. So, yeah. Pardon? Oh, you just answered it? OK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And are you familiar with Kickstarter? I mean, I know it's kind of a different type of thing. But yeah. Have you ever thought of doing more than one thing? Yes, and it's a very conscious choice to do one at a time. Um, the biggest reason for that is that there are lots of marketplace model sites out there. We have Global Giving, we have um, Network for Good, we have Kickstarter, which doesn't do causes, but it's very similar in that, in that vein. Um, our generation needs novelty, and we need focus. And the one deal at a time gives constant novelty, constant urgency, and, and the, the speed that really appeals to our generation. So that's what's behind that choice. It probably won't be that way forever. Um, as we scale, um, there are ways that we can scale that keep the one deal at a time feel without literally being one deal at a time. So, yeah. What else? Other thoughts? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's, that's a situation where acting big doesn't cut it. You actually have to be big. <laughs> and so we'll get there. But at this point, the answer is no. So, yeah. So you set the standard at $1. Mm -hmm. Have you had any experiences where people have come and said, here's 100, here's 100? Yes, quite often, actually. Um, it happens in every bucket. Um, the average donation size is like 350 so if you, there's about 60% of the donations are $1, and then 80% fall in $5 or less. And then from there, it's usually 20s, 50s, or 1,000. So. All right, thank you so much.